So without further ado, I would like to invite on stage uh, Pedro Moreno Sanchez from the University of Vienna to speak about dual output linkable ring signatures in Monero. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's uh, my pleasure to be here. It's the first time I joined this community. I'm really glad to, to be here and talk to you. It was uh, really an experience. And I'm going to try to talk about uh, some work that we have been doing, and I imagine it can be helpful and of interest to all of you. And it's mostly about uh, how to solve or how to handle the scalability problem in, in Monero. Before that, I have to say that I'm an applied cryptographer. As uh, Brandon said, I am in Vienna. And in general, I'm interested in the security and privacy problems with uh, cryptocurrencies in general, and Monero in particular. I guess that for most of you, actually, it's not a uh, surprise if I say that Monero has a scalability issue, as many other cryptocurrencies today. And the permissionless and decentralized consensus algorithm limit the transaction rate to a ballpark of uh, 10 transactions per second. This is way lower than the, what we would need if Monero is going to cater a growing number of users and transactions where systems like Visa, which is obviously more decentralized, but supports around or more than 10,000 10, transactions per second. Um, another issue that we are seeing with, with Monero and with other cryptocurrencies as well is the size of the blockchain is, is growing dramatically. I mean, Sarang presented really cool graphs about that. Um, I think today the size is a bit more than 70 gigabytes, and ballpark, the growth rate is around one gigabyte per month. So in order to solve uh, these problems that appears in other cryptocurrencies, we, I can, or we can actually group them in a couple of, of groups. One is uh, on-chain or changes in the consensus layer. Layer one, uh, Saran presented uh, some of the cool things that you have been doing in the community to improve the on-chain scalability. And the second group, which is the one I'm going to focus in my talk, is go off-chain, application layer, layer two, payment channels, you can call it uh, in many different ways. And uh, I'm interested in this uh, because uh, it's a technique that has been shown uh, useful in other blockchains, uh, in other cryptocurrencies. For example, we have the sample of the Lightning Network in Bitcoin, the Rider Network in Ethereum, and there are also other research efforts like the Bolt Network, C Channels, um, Peru, and many other. So the question is why don't we research and look at the idea of having payment channel, payment channel networks in Monero itself? But before we go into details, uh, let's make sure that we are on the same page. Let's try to see what we can learn from payment channels in other cryptocurrencies. So the idea is, is pretty simple. So we have two users, Alice and Bob. Uh, let's say Alice has some coins, Bitcoins, for example. And she wants to buy a product from Bob. Let's say she, she wants to buy some books. The naive way and what has been done in cryptocurrency so far is that Alice pays for every single payment on chain. So she creates, if she wants to buy, let's say, five books, she will perform five transactions, all of them will go onto the chain. This is fine, everybody could verify that, nothing problematic with that except for the scalability problem. So what we can do instead is create what is called an opening channel transaction. A transaction in which Alec takes her coins, which are in this input of five coins, for example, and transfer it to what is called a multi-seek contract, or an output which is shared by a public key of Alice and Bob. And this intuitively means that when the coins are transferred to this multi-seek contract, or scroll account, as you might also have heard, they can only be transferred further if Alice and Bob agree on that. Okay? So they must agree in order to transfer these coins from that output somewhere else. And obviously, because Bob could always go offline and never collaborate with, with Alice anymore, we need what's called the refund output. Or like after some time, Alice should be able to recover back the coins on herself without the collaboration of Bob. Okay? So this is called multi-seek contract. It's available in other cryptocurrencies, and it's how open uh, payment channels are actually open. Once we, we have that, uh, there is an open channel between Alice and Bob with a value of five in this example. So now imagine that Alice wants to use that channel to pay for books uh, to Bob. What she can do is just create a transaction off-chain, this doesn't go to the blockchain, in which she takes the scroll account, the account shared by Alice and Bob, and create two outputs. One where she gets four coins back to herself, and one coin goes uh, to Bob. In that manner, she's actually paying one coin out of the scroll to, to Bob itself. This transaction is signed by Alice, and this signature is sent over to, to Bob itself. At this point, Bob is actually happy with this transaction because he knows that the only thing that he has to do is sign it by himself, but he knows the, the signing key for that key. So he knows that he can always sign it and put it on the, on the chain if he, if he wants. 
However, he's not going to do that. What's he's going to do? He's going to wait for more payments coming from, from Alice. So imagine that Alice wants to pay now for an extra uh, Bitcoin. So Alice will create a second transaction where she transfer three coins from the scroll to herself and two coins to Bob. That matters. Uh, for Bob, it's more beneficial, it's more profitable, actually, to keep this transaction. He can forget for the previous one. And as you can imagine, we can repeat this process again and again to pay from Alice to Bob in off-chain. There will be a moment, obviously, in which uh, Bob really wants to get the coins back or get the coins on the blockchain. So what he will do is take the last state, the last off-chain transaction, sign it himself, and then put it on the chain. Okay? So intuitively, what's happening here is that we really need only two transactions on chain, one to open the, the channel, one to close it. And we can have many, many, many payments that are off-chain and never hit the blockchain itself. Okay? So the scalability gain, in a sense, is, is really huge, because it's not that the verification time is, is small. It's just zero. Like We don't really have to verify the transactions that never make it to the blockchain itself. This is an example of a channel between two people. And obviously, it's a, it's a nice structure, but only allows to have payments between two, between Alice and Bob. What we would like to have is to have a, a technique or a network in which Alice could pay to anybody else. Okay? So the naive way would be that Alice create a channel with every single other user in the network. But this will be really expensive, because for each of those channels, Alice has to create this scroll account and has to lock coins in advance. What instead is used in practice is called a payment channel network. So basically, Alice is going to create a bunch of channels, depending on the money that she has with some of her friends. And hopefully, those friends will create channels with other people on the, on the, on the community or in the network, creating what is called a payment channel network. Okay. So now, imagine this example in which Alice wants to pay to Carol, but she does not have a payment channel directly to her, but a payment that goes indirectly through, through Bob. What's going to happen in practice is Alice will actually send this Bitcoin to, to Bob, who in turn is going to actually forward it to Carol itself. If done naively, as you can imagine, this has a huge security problem. Right? So Bob could just run away with the coins as soon as he, he gets a coin from, from Alice itself. So what we need to do is to have some magic cryptographic operation that allow us to have this operation atomically. That means that uh, Bob will be able to get the coins from Alice if and only if Bob forwards them to Carol. Right? In other words, Bob cannot run away with the money that comes from, from Alice itself. This uh, thing in practice is actually implemented with a concept which is called conditional payment. And if we go back to the setting that we had before, here is an off-chain payment that goes from Alice to Bob for a value one, right? So Alice is paying one, one coin to Bob. So what we are doing for conditional payment is adding additional cryptographic conditions to the payment itself. So in particular, we are adding a cryptographic condition Y, which intuitively means that Bob not only needs to sign this transaction with his signing key, but he also needs to learn the value X that allows to open the lock or to open the cryptographic condition that is encoded in the value Y itself. As before, uh, Bob could probably just disappear or could probably never be able to solve uh, this cryptographic challenge. So we would, what we will need to add as well is a timeout, no? like have some time for Bob actually to solve this cryptographic puzzle. But if Bob doesn't do it, after some time, Alice should be able to return or to recover the coins, <laughs> recover the coins back to, to herself. This is uh, something that has been uh, done in the literature and the research itself, and is actually implemented in practice. In the case of the Lightning Network, they are using what is called a hash time lock contract. Uh, basically, Alice pays to Bob uh, under the condition that Bob shows some value X, such that it's a valid play image of the value y, which is the crypt. And here, they rely on the fact that uh, finding the, the pre-image of a hash function is a cryptographic hard problem, if you don't know it in advance. Another <laughs> the problem, or oh, this is uh, implemented in the Latin network, the problem is that uh, we don't have a scripting language in Monero. So we will need to add this uh, as a scripted or in the consensus layer itself in Monero. Um, Another approach that we have in practice is called this uh, multi-hop lock, which is another way of uh, implementing conditional payments in which Alice will pay to Bob, uh, for example, one Bitcoin, if Bob shows some value x, such that x times g is equal to y, when y is the condition. You can think of it intuitively that Bob will get the money if he's able to 
uh, to create or to guess uh, the private key for a public key. Okay? So he managed to, to get the private key for a public key that he doesn't know. He actually can uh, receive the coins. This uh, it goes more in line, or because, I mean, if, if you know, it goes into the D lock setting. So this goes more in line to the signature scheme that you have in Monero already. And there are non constructions that require either Schnorr or ECDC. The problem, as uh, Sarang mentioned before, is that the linkable ring signature that you have in, in Monero today is none of, of the two. So it's a different version of these signature schemes. So the question or the point that we are trying to do in this work is can we adapt these conditional payments to the signature scheme that you have in Monero today? What are the changes that we need to do? So this is the, the main idea of our approach. The first thing that we had to do is uh, define what we call dual output or a new output format for Monero. Okay? A uh, bit of disclaimer, I'm going to over, uh, oversimplify some things of uh, or some of the cryptographic parts of how Monero works. I encourage you to listen to the talk of Sarang. He gave uh, a really good detail to how these things uh, look like in practice. But then I'm going to just mention what is needed for, for my talk here. So uh, currently, Monero, the outputs are composed of three elements intuitively. One is the, the public key itself, the one-time account. Then we have a commitment to the amount of coins that are held at that uh, public key. And as we have seen, there is a range proof that proves that this uh, commitment is uh, within some range between 0 to, to 264, it's like 64 bits value. So what we are proposing is slightly modifying this output as follows. Here I have highlighted in blue the additions that we are proposing. So one is that instead of having a single public key, now every output is going to have two of them. Okay? I have public key 0 and public key 1. We are going to maintain exactly the commitment to the amount as it is today, and we are going to maintain the range proof. Okay? You can see this as a really good thing because most of the um, scalability approaches and all these uh, clever tricks that we have seen before can be also applied to this uh, DLSAC as well, to this, uh, this project as well. Um, but then we need uh, an extra element, which is this called flag T. Basically, it's an element that you can think of it as a flag that determines whether we are going to use the PK0 or the PK1 in the output. Okay? So it's a flag that determines which of the two public keys in the output we are going to use to, to spend it later. Okay? So if we introduce a new output format, most likely we are going to need also a new signature scheme. So this is the one we are proposing. Um, before, let's remember or let's remind uh, the one that you have today. Okay? So the one, the one that you use in Monero is MLSAC, which is a slight modification of LSAC itself. And intuitively, uh, the signature scheme of this LSAC has as an input a transaction, so a bunch of inputs, a bunch of outputs, and uh, you have an N public keys, or the public keys that uh, form the, the ring, the decoys that you want to, to spend, out of which or, or one of those public keys is the one that you're actually going to spend. And then you need the secret key for that public key that you're going to spend. right? And uh, the signature scheme uh, has as an output a ring that is formed somehow mathematically. It's not important here. But what is important is that it's also the signature scheme outputs a key image, right? which in this case is computed as uh, uh, the secret key for the, spending, for the spending public key times the hash of the public key. And I want to highlight that the key image is crucial for the avoiding double spending in Monero, as, as has been highlighted before in, from before this talk. In, I mean, intuitively, the key image uh, makes sure that if the same public key is used twice uh, within two rings, uh, then the key image is the same. And then we can detect that there is a double spending. And how miners actually make, uh, keep track of that is like they maintain a list of key images that have been used uh, so far and check whether a new signature, a new transaction, comes with a key image that has been used before. And if that's the case, they just uh, discard the new, the new transaction because possibly a uh, double spend. So this is, um, key images is a crucial aspect, and any new signature scheme that is proposed should be careful on how to propose or how to actually build this, uh, this key image itself. So this is the main challenge that we had in this project it, itself as well. So in this project, we define the LSAC. And obviously, if we have uh, defined a new output format, we are going to use this output format also in the signature scheme. So basically, in the signature scheme, we are going to have a transaction. We are going to assign Monero transactions that send money from input to output. 
But now instead of using rings of single keys, uh, we are going to use rings where each position is a dual, uh, dual output or a pair of, a pair of keys. Okay? So you have n entries, and every entry is a pair of keys. Now to determine which of the two, which of the two keys at each position is being used, uh, then we have to look at this flag value, this t value that we have also introduced. Right? So intuitively, for example, imagine that you have t equals 0 then we will use the zeroth coordinate of each of the points, or the key on the left for each of the entries in the, in the ring. And obviously, if t is equal 1, we will use the complementary ones. We use the, the one on the, on the right. And if you look at here, it, once you have uh, fixed one of the t's, t equals 0, t equals 1, the input that you have looks really similar, actually it's the same, as uh, you have in the current signature in Monero, right? So you have a ring of single keys at each position and one signing key that you're going to use to sign the transaction. So that means that at this point you can use exactly the same signature scheme that you have with all the um, improvements that you have been thinking so far. So the output of a scheme is going to be a ring as you constructed today. But as I said, the important part or the key part here was how to construct the key image itself. Let's see how or why this is, was difficult and what is the, the important point here. So the, the first approach or the naive approach would be, okay, you have already a key image uh, mechanism. Why don't we use the, the same, right? The problem is that if we use the same as you have, imagine that we have t equals zero, we will have to define the key image as the multiplication or the combination of the secret key of the zeroth coordinate and hash of the public key of the zeroth coordinate. Right? And the problem is that this does not encode at all information about the one coordinate of the dual output. That means that the public key for when t is equal 0 will be totally different from the public key when t is equal 1. That in practice means that if you spend a dual output when t is equal 0, you could double spend the dual output with t is equal 1 because the key images are, are different. So we cannot use the, or this is the main reason why we cannot use the key image as it is today. Instead, what we require is a key image that needs to be computed with both of the public keys. So basically with the tuple of public key on the left, or the zero, the public key one, and one of the secret key. Okay? And the second requirement is that independently of the two of the keys that we are spending, independently of whether we are spending the key at the zeroth position or the key at the ones position, the key image should be the same, right? Only if it's the same, we could actually detect that the same output is being spent twice, independently of what of the two positions we are trying to spend. Once we look at this, and if you have some background in cryptography, if not, it's, it's okay as well, but this is uh, clearly what we saw, it is clearly the, a Diffie-Hellman problem, so we can solve this using a Diffie-Hellman key exchange. The idea is that if you take, if you are in the case of t equals zero, you can take the secret key at the zero position and multiply by the public key on the t equal one. Uh, and this operation would be, or the result of this operation would be the same as if you take the secret key in the one's position and multiply by the pk zero. So by the construction of the Hellman, this is a computation in which doesn't matter if t is equal to 0 or 1, the key image will be the same, and you can actually check that the same up or the same dual output is spent twice. Okay? So once we, we have this scheme, uh, the final DL sack looks looks like that. So the input is the same as we saw before. We fix one of the one of the t's, so either 0 or 1. Once we fix them, we have a ring as before and one of the secret keys. And now this uh, key image is computed such that independently of the secret key that we are using, the key image will be, will be the same, okay? depending if we are t equals 0 or t equals 1. And the cool thing is that only with that we have uh, enough crypto, we have enough uh, machinery to build payment channels in Monero. Okay? So here you have the example of what we have seen before, this multi seek output. So what, how we can emulate that in Monero now is that we could have a dual output in which both of the keys belong to Alice. And now this will go into a scroll dual output in which the key on the left is shared by Alice and Bob. Then we can do the same tricks as before. And the key on the right is a key belonging to Alice itself. It's the refund transaction. Okay? So if the time is before some block height, then we are in the scroll setting, the key on the left. 
And if the time is bigger than some block height, then we are in the refund setting. So Alice can spend on her own, actually. This is how we can open a channel. And now we can perform several off-chain payments by spending from this special scroll account with scroll dual output. Uh, imagine that we are in the t equals zero, in the setting where we are using the key on the left. Then Alice could give the, her hot signature where she spends the five coins into two dual outputs. One that belongs only to Alice, and she gets uh, four coins. And one in which there is uh, only one coin, and both of the keys belong to, to Bob. Okay? So this actually shows that with DLSAC, we have enough information, we have enough machinery to, to build uh, payment chains and stuff. The second part, or the cool part was, uh, or what we need actually to have payment channels, have conditional payments in, in Monero itself. And just a recap, uh, payment or conditional payments today in cryptocurrencies are built either with HCLCs, so this requires to lend the pre of a hash value, and this is, requires also to add script to the, to the cryptocurrency, or we can use multi-hop lock, okay? And in this work, in this project, we are, what we are exploring is whether we can use this multi-hop lock idea, but in a compatible manner with this new signature scheme, how we, how we do that. I don't have time to give you the, the details of how the protocol works, but the intuition is that I have two users, Alice and Bob, and they share a dual output where the public key on the left is the scroll account, and the public key on the right doesn't matter, could be the refund from Alice also. And the challenge here is that Bob should receive the money only if he learns the secret key associated to the public key in the challenge, right? Actually, and how it's gonna work is that Alice creates a half signature, so give this, her part of the signature that Bob can finish only if he learns the, the challenge, only if he learns the secret key associated to PKC. And the second thing that we need is that if Bob actually manages to do that, if Bob learns for some reason the secret key, by showing the signature itself, Alice should be also be able to learn the secret key from the signature. Okay? So these are the two requirements that we need to encode conditional payments. A bit of intuition how the protocol will work. Uh, it's a protocol that needs uh, four messages. Uh, that's displayed here. The first message, they create the joint public key, or this scroll account between the two of them. And they use a shared randomness, where there is randomness from Alice, randomness from Bob, and, and the challenge itself. And the intuition for that is this ensures that uh, uh, the, three, the three parts must be part of the signature. So Alice must uh, use her signing key, Bob must use his signing key, and, but also the signing key C should be there. So also they must learn the solution for the, for the challenge. Now, once we have that, as we have seen before, they exchange their one-third of their parts of the signature, what they can do so far, knowing the randomness and their own sending keys. And once they learn, or when Bob learns the, the solution to the challenge, then he can finalize the signature and give it to, to Alice back. And once Alice has this, you can think of it as a simple equation with three unknowns, uh, sigma, alpha, sigma, beta, and, and, the, and the secret C, or basically the secret for the, for the challenge. So Alice knows both of sigma A and sigma B at this point, so she can actually extract the secret C itself, okay? So I don't have too much time left, but yeah, we have evaluated the uh, DLSAC, this uh, new signature scheme. We have looked at the number of operations that we, we need to perform if we have this DLSAC, and we have estimated that it's around 7% 7, uh, 7 faster than the current signature scheme that you have. And the main intuition for that is that we don't need this hash to point in the key image. If you show the key image, it's just uh, algebraic operations between the two keys. So this actually makes the signature faster. But obviously the trade-off is that we need a bit of, uh, we need an extra key in the output and this extra flag in the output itself. And in the signature size, it's the same as, as you have in the LSAC plus this extra bit to determine whether we use one key or, or the other. Um, we, have, we are really curious about the security and privacy. We have formally proven the security and privacy notions for uh, the signature schemes, in particular that the unforgeability, senior ambiguity, and linkability. And we are also studying the fungibility. So how, what will be the effect in fungibility of introducing this DLSAC into the signature scheme? And I will be more happy to talk about that later if you, have, if you want to talk to me about it. And uh, it also allows to have interoperable payments. So it will allow for the first time to have payments in which uh, 
person receives uh, Bitcoin, let's say, and then you forward them into Monero. And the main idea here is to concatenate these two new techniques, uh, the multi-hop block based on ECDSA or Schnorr, if they are in Bitcoin, and the DL SAC base that we're proposing in this, in this work. More details are in the paper, just to give you the idea that you can now have payments with other cryptocurrencies itself. There are plenty of things that we can do in the future work, and I'm happy to uh, say more in the questions if you if you're interested about it. So, in the minus 10 seconds I have, let me tell you what uh, we have done here. So, basically, we are interested in general in this project about the scalability and the lack of interoperability that there is today between Monero and other cryptocurrencies, just because of the cryptography that is being used so far. So here we are looking at how to extend the signature schemes that you have, or contribute in one, which is called the LSAC, which is provably secure and enables for the first time payment channels and conditional payments in, in Monero. I've seen it's as, at least as efficient as the current one that you, you have and can be done as an extension of the one that you have so far and allows interoperable payments with other cryptocurrencies itself. With that, I would like to finish. Thank you for staying at this time of the conference and your attention. I will be happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. I have a question, but yes. I'm going to hold it till later because I had an idea. Anyone, mm -hmm. does anybody have any questions? Ray, great, right back here. Um, my first question is really fairly simple in, in, in this kind of a scheme. What happens if you can't close the channel because the blockchain is overloaded and you simply can't close the channel? This is an excellent question and um, it's a problem with this uh, layer two approaches in general. It's called the avalanche problem. And it's what happens if there is enough, there's not enough bandwidth in the, in the, in the blockchain itself. Um, something that is not inherent to our scheme, but inherent to any other layer two approach. Um, the hope is that by now, uh, most, if you deploy the LSAC or you deploy any layer two uh, technology, most of the payments will be off-chain any, anyway. So then you reduce the load of the chain itself. Right? So there will be way less payments that have to be into the blockchain. Um, even with that, there is still the possibility that you cannot close it. So how the, they are thinking to account for that in practice is in terms of fees, actually. So anytime there is some risk, you can put a higher fee on your payments, such that you, you account for those, for the channels that you can close, you get fees for it, and, and you account for the money that you might lose if you cannot close your channel. Yep. A good point. It's a, it's, a, it's a challenge and a research challenge that we are looking at it, not only from Monero, but from many cryptocurrencies. Yep. Um, can the efficiency savings in CLSAG and the dual output payment channel abilities of DLSAG be combined to have the best of both worlds? If you ask me right now, I, I would rather say yes, but one has to be careful actually and see how the, the math works. As I said, like I think most of the um, uh, improvements in the CLSAG uh, goes with the range proof and the commitment itself, and we are not touching them, so we are using them as they, as they are. So I am highly confident that could be could be done, but yeah, until I don't check, uh, probably I would not say yes for 100 percent. But it's something uh, worth exploring, definitely. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thanks. Mm -hmm. Actually, in answer to that question, um, we do have some methods of doing some compression that we haven't proven the security for yet. But so I didn't mean to take that away from you. But um, short answer is maybe. Yeah. Do we have any last questions? Okay, everybody give Dr. Pedro Moreno Sanchez a hand. Thank you.